Good morning, everybody. How are you? You know, I'll tell you, it's a little intimidating after awesome worship and Vanessa, who always rocks as MC, is like, I'm supposed to come up and say something equally good? That's a hard road to take. But, but my wife and I, we live in Rehoboth, and we love this church. It's about an hour's drive from Rehoboth, that's sort of Providence metro area almost, up here. And we drive up here, and I think to myself, how many people thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are we driving by on the way coming up here. These are people that don't know Jesus. They're not going to be in church. They're just going through life, sailing through life, not even understanding what it is that they're missing out on. What a terrible thing that is. And I'm so psyched to have churches like Connect that are so serious about wanting to show the greatness and the love of Jesus into everybody's life and to welcome more and more people into this congregation. So we, I'll tell you, we love this church. We were, in, um, we were in Providence yesterday evening, the end of the afternoon, for a wedding. And it wasn't your ordinary wedding because it was a couple that we had met through the Providence Rescue Mission, a couple who had been homeless. Their lives had spun off out of control. The wheels had come off. And then they both found Jesus. And they started stitching things back together in their lives and have gotten their lives organized. And they were getting married at this really cool, completely with it, third floor church in a, just a, a building in downtown Providence. And, um, and that was an awesome thing. But here's what it was juxtaposed against. Yesterday, end of the afternoon yesterday, was the Gay Pride Parade in Providence. The, the, in the city that the Barna survey has said is the least biblically-minded metro area in the country, right by right Providence. And, and as I parked, I had to park over by the Providence Place Mall and walk over to where the, the uh, wedding was. And this song got into my mind by uh, Twyla Paris. If any of you remember Twyla Paris, it said, and the lyric went something like, um, they are not your enemy, flesh and blood has been deceived. And I thought, that's what I'm seeing here. All these people who are coming out looking for different and exotic ways to express themselves. Why? Because they're floundering around lost without a shepherd. I thought, what an incredible need it is for people to find Jesus. And we know people like that. Each one of us knows people like that. Some people even in our own families. And so I just want to encourage you to be praying for people and to be giving them the good news of Jesus because they need it so much. My, uh, my wife and I, um, we're having dinner with a, a pastor from New York State and his wife recently, and um, they, he's a campus pastor of a really cool church in a college town. And so they have lots of college students coming in and out of their church. And you know, college students, the statistics tell us, are the mo- some of the most nimble spiritual things that are out there. They've got questions, and they want to pursue these questions and find out what's going on. So in his church, they have a lot of people coming in and out, in and out, asking questions and curious and um, there were two girls, two college girls, who asked if they could come over for dinner one night with the pastor's family. And they said, sure. And these girls were Muslim. And they wanted to come over for dinner and ask them questions about Jesus from the perspective of Islam. Help us to understand who Jesus is more so that we can plug him into our, uh, our Muslim worldview because uh, Muslims consider Jesus to be a prophet, nothing more than that, but a prophet. So they had a bunch of questions. They had a delightful evening together, a lot of questions and answers, great time. A couple weeks later, one of the girls called and she said, I'd be interested in coming back to dinner. Would that be okay? And they said, sure, I'll be happy to have you. And she said, she said well, you can't tell my friend that I've called you. She said, well, come on over. So they, she came over, they were having dinner. And she says, I got to tell you something that I did the last couple weeks since being here last time. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And nobody knows. You're the first people I've told about this. And uh, they talked a little bit more. She said, would it be all right with you if I took my headscarf off? And so she unwound her headscarf, and they just had this delightful meal. And she getting to interact with Christian believers really for the first time as a believer in her life. And then she sort of dropped the hammer. She said, my parents are both devout Muslims. And so this means when I tell them that I've become a believer, they will disown me from the family. And so I haven't told them yet, and I've decided that I'm going to wait until I've gotten all the way through college, and then I'm going to tell them when I'm ready to be off on my own. She said, because they will disown me, and they will never have anything to do with me again. But my relationship with Jesus is the most important relationship in my life, and it's not one that I'm going to walk away from. 
What a great story that was, huh? Well, you know, sometimes, sometimes I wish that I had that same level of commitment to following all of the commands that God lays out for me because, you know, some of them are hard in life, aren't they? The easy ones, fine. Some of the harder ones can be a struggle for us as Christian believers as we seek to pursue these things because of other stuff going on in our lives that can distract us or that can cause us to second guess the goodness of what God is bringing about when he commands us to do something. You know, for our kids, if we tell our kids, we want you to have more cookies today, there's no command associated with this. That's just a permission thing. Commands are things that are difficult, things that we're going to struggle with. And today, I want to look at this question in Scripture of how do, is it that we pursue obedience in the face of difficult commands? How do we pursue obedience in the face of difficult commands? And so before we plunge into that, I want to pray, and I just want to, I'm going to ask God to do something. That is because you know that God is able to cause you to hear anything that he needs you to hear during the service today. doesn't matter whether I speak the words or not. God can cause you to hear anything you want. And I want every person to walk out of here, myself included, to be transformed by his word and his presence today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are excited to be here this morning. Excited to be in your presence, to feel your presence with us. We desire for our lives to be directed by you to have our lives find meaning in you, purpose in you, and to go forth and do the things that you've equipped us as individuals and as a church to do. Lord, this morning, as we focus on your word in this portion of our service, Lord, we ask that you would touch each one of us, help each one of us to hear your voice speaking to us and know how it is you're calling us forward, areas that we need should be changed, areas we should redirect, something that we should embrace anew. Lord, speak to each one of us, and may you be glorified by our presence and by our thoughts and our actions this morning. We pray it all in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Our primary text for today comes out of the Old Testament book of Joshua chapter 3. I want to give you a little background. If you're not especially familiar with this portion of the Bible, let me paint a little picture for you. We're, you're familiar with the Israelites. They've spent 400 years in captivity in the Egyptian, with the Egyptians. And finally, they've called out and they've called out and God has raised up for them the man who's going to be their leader to bring them through this, and that's Moses. Moses goes through these conniptions with, um, with Pharaoh and eventually Pharaoh relents in the face of the plagues and agrees to let them go. And they have this miraculous escape through God, with God parting the Red Sea, they go into the wilderness and then God closes the Red Sea behind them and eliminates the Egyptian army which has suddenly come out to try to bring them back into captivity. And God's plan for them is not to spend very long in the wilderness before they cross over into the promised land. That's his plan for them. But they have their share of struggles learning to follow God during this time. And one of which is they end up testing him and um, uh, um, fail that test. And as a result, God says, you know what? You are not all going to go into the promised land. Instead, it is going to be your children that get to the, enter the promised land. You're going to wander in the wilderness. And that's what proceeds to happen to them for 40 years. God's abundant provision and blessing in them does not disappear during that time. He feeds them the manna. This must have been this awesome frosted flakes that they gather on the ground every day that always tastes good. They can boil it. They can pound it. They can do all sorts of stuff with it. And it's delicious. I love frosted flakes. They, they, it's delicious. And, and God provides them water. And their sandals do not wear out. Their clothing does not wear out. He watches over them during this time. Moses, who is the most incredible leader, if you follow the story of Moses, it's, it's amazing. He starts off being a guy who does not want to be a leader. God, find somebody else. Please, God, find somebody else to do this. But he says, okay, God, I'll do it. And he leads them during this time, and it is not an easy time for Moses. They rebel against God. They rebel against Moses. Moses pleads with God. He keeps leading them and leading them and leading them. But in the process, there is um, an unfortunate event happens in the life of Moses. The people go thirsty again for water after it's happened one time, and God tells Moses to speak to a rock and out will flow water, if you remember this story. It's the second time this has happened. The first time, God had told Moses to strike the rock with your staff and that would come water. The second time, he says, speak to the rock, 
Moses, however, strikes it, does not speak. And water flows through. God provides the water. But he says to Moses, because of that, you will not go into the promised land. So God punishes Moses for this. He has been their powerful leader all these years. And now that leadership is gone. And into Moses' place is stepping Joshua. <laughs> Who wants to follow in Moses' footsteps? Well, but, Josh, but God is raising up this next leader for them. And that person is Joshua. And that's where we're going to pick up our description today as, as God is, is preparing to bring them across the Jordan River into the Promised Land, led by their new, uh, 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 their new human leader, which is Joshua. As we look at these steps that are going to happen as they prepare to go in and go into the promised land, we learn some great things about, uh, uh, about obeying God in difficult times. Some of these principles can really help us because we all face difficulties, don't we, at times, as we're seeking to obey God? So I, as I figure, let's look at what God tells us about doing this rather than just trying to figure out on our own. The, the first thing we see is that God has this bigger picture about the events and the circumstances, what's, what he's seeking to bring about at a time, a much bigger picture than we do. We have this narrow view. God's got the full view. Reading in Joshua chapter 3, verse 7, the first, that verse reads, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Don't you wonder why events happen? It does to me all the time. I think, I wonder why that happened. I wonder what God had going on here. And when I do that, I tend to, th I'm thinking singularly. I think, well, there must be one reason why God is doing this or one thing that he's seeking to bring about through these events. When I do, I know I'm thinking narrowly because I'm thinking self-focused or on one individual person around me, probably some person I love, which is why I'm spending time thinking about it. But I think narrowly. I don't think broadly as God can. And so, when we read, and so we see God starting to open things up here to something different because what do we expect God is doing here? He's going to show his power and his might by bringing them into the promised land. Yet, he's doing something different here, what he's just said to Joshua. He says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. What's he doing? He's got to elevate Joshua. If they're going to follow a leader, it's not Moses anymore, so it's going to have to be Joshua. So God is doing something bigger than what we would have imagined. And I love this, something related that Paul writes for us in his New Testament letter to the church in Rome. He writes, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Amen. One of the things I love about that is the impact that he's suggesting is it is on everybody. When circumstances are going on now, what's the single reason? No, God is working in everybody's life simultaneously to bring about a myriad of things the way that only God can do. So when God is getting ready to bring the Israelites there across the Jordan River into the Promised Land, it's not just about giving them this, this uh, future. It's not just about giving this land that's going to be flowing with milk and honey. No, it's also this thing where he's elevating this new leader for them. God, God has this much bigger picture for what he is trying to do. I think this is the second part we all know at times by experience, and that is that obedience can be scary, can't it? It's like, why? Because we're stepping into uncharted waters. Obedience can be scary. When obedience is easy, it's not really obedience. It's just sort of following along with what we, we think may be good. You, you know, but it's interesting. So if we, I'll read a verse, and you may not get it yet unless you read the passage before. You've read it before. Verse 8 reads that God then spoke to Joshua and said, Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Well, fine. What's the big deal about that? We're in the Mideast here. Rivers are all small. There's nothing going on. Fine. It's just like a little stream almost. Just go stand in the river, and the people will cross over by you, and then they'll go into the promised land. If we don't, if you've never read this passage before, there doesn't seem to be anything uh, that really speaks out to us from there as being unusual, does there? My, um, I just returned from Ontario on a canoe trip, off in the bush, off in the bush which was awesome. And my, uh, my oldest son was with me. We had flown into Minneapolis and we went from there. We get, got back to Minneapolis and we were going to be heading home, but we had an, about a day and a half. And so we decided we, that we were going to, we had planned we would do a little bit of a road trip. 
and uh, these western landscapes are awesome and it takes a lot of time, but we got into a car, we went into southwestern Minnesota and then South Dakota and Nebraska and Iowa trying to check some states off his list and that was way too much driving for one day. But we saw something really awesome during that time. We crossed the bridge over into Nebraska right by the Missouri River, which is not this little small northeastern river, but is this expansive western river. The Missouri River is what Lewis and Clark started up on their core of discovery. And the Missouri River barely is flowing. And they say it drops one foot every mile. And we weren't there. We were there in early June. So the spring floods were gone and there were just massive sandbars everywhere. And I was stunned by the breadth and scope of this river, something that we're just not used to seeing here. So we see big rivers with a lot of power. And then we continue reading on in our text and we start getting a little sense of the fact that maybe there's something different going on than just crossing a little river. Verse 15 tells us that now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvests. So, huh, God is getting ready for them to cross, but it's not just some little thing. It is a swollen river with a lot of volume pumping through it. You ever see these news clips? of people who have tried to drive their cars and trucks through swollen streams. There it goes, floating on down. And the reporter says, please don't drive through a flooded stream because you never know if the road is washed out or this or that. Well, here it is, it's flood stage. And what's God telling them to do? The priests, go step into the river. This would not have been, I don't suspect, something that the priest would would have said, hey, great, that sounds like a good idea, God. It's only flood stage. Now, uh, now, I don't know about you, but I like to think that I have a fairly healthy dose of common sense. Anybody here a lot of common sense? And so I think to myself, if I were the priest, I would have said, Lord, there are some alternatives here. Rather than stepping into this raging torrent right now, we could build a bridge or we've been wandering for 40 years. What's a couple more weeks between friends and let the floodwaters subside a little bit? It's got to be going through their heads. This is a significant thing. This is a scary thing that God is calling us to do. That's where obedience starts getting a little harder, isn't it? when we can see the problem sitting out before us. I don't think the obedience uh, struggles for us are so much uncertainties, like I wonder what this is going to be like. It's when the problem is laid out right there. We think, but, 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 God, I see the problem. I can see it right here in front of me. Are you sure this, are you, maybe I'm not hearing you right, God. Are you sure this is what you want me doing? Because obedience can be scary for us. But in the process, we always have to think in mind that God has the best in mind for us and he's got something else planned. And part of that is, is that when we see problems laid out in front of us, we need to remember that God has solutions to problems that we never dreamed of being possible. We look at, there's this or this, not 50 other things that God could do to bring it about. You know, I like to think of myself as a problem solver. And um, I'll tell you, God comes up with solutions in my life all the time. There's nothing like what I thought might make sense as the way to handle it. So here's God's solution to this. Yet as soon as the priests who carry the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. No, that's not a solution I want to come up with. I think my bridge idea is still a pretty good one, God. You know, when I was a kid, we grew, I grew up in Wilbraham, home of Friendly's Ice Cream. Friendly's Ice Cream, anybody? That is good ice cream, huh? And then we moved to Vermont, where they make Ben and Jerry's, which brings it to a whole nother level. But, but there, were, there were lots of streams in our neighborhood, and I love to go to these streams and make little dams. You know, pile up the rocks and back up some water behind it, and then there'd be a low spot where the water's getting over, so i go fill up that thing, you know, and... But what do I see? You know, I'm never able to stop the water. Beavers, if you know anything about beavers, I I know a lot about the natural world. You know, beavers are triggered. The sound of running water triggers them to go and work on their dam some more. So if you've ever pulled some logs out of a beaver dam, you go back the next day and it's all tidied up again. They've come and plugged the holes because that's the way that God has wired them. Well, my little dam building when I was a little kid, all wet and muddy, messing around a stream, I never got the water to stop, Right? 
I just got the water to back up a little bit and make a little impoundment, but the water's still busy rushing over and downstream, it's still, it's still a stream, right? I haven't stopped it. What happened here was completely different. And that's what God does. God's solutions are way different in situations than we often would expect them to be. You know, related to this is something else that's super important, and that is that God's timing is always perfect when we have significant obstacles in front of us. The text continues to read in verses 16 and 17, it, the water, piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Red Sea, was completely cut off. Geographers will tell us that that was three hours upstream. God's incredible timing. So those priests, they come up, they got the ark. Only the priests can touch the ark or everybody else dies. They step in, boom, the water stops. Well, God's timing, he had to calculate this all to knowing the second that they were going to step in and that's when the water would be gone. And they come and they stand on dry land in the middle while the million plus people make their crossing of the Jordan River into the promised land. God's timing is always perfect. And it's unexpected, isn't it? God, you gotta do something, you gotta do something, I don't know what you're gonna do. And oftentimes for us, we think, God, you missed it or I needed you earlier, you had to do something sooner. In God's equation, in his calculus, he knows when the right timing is. He may, it may be that he wants us to walk through something difficult. It may be that he wants to see some other people grow. He may, maybe he wants us to grow. But his timing is always perfect. And so we see these struggles of obeying God at times. Don't we? He commands us to do something and our brains get going. And why is that? God has made us with terrific brains. We've got the biggest brains out there of the animal kingdom, and we're doing all these things, and we can, we can evaluate situations, and God has used the human brain and blessed, uh, blessed Christian believers to come up with all sorts of, uh, of significant inventions and developments that benefit all of mankind. So God does not waste our brains. But then it become a, these brains can become a challenge for us too at the same time because we keep thinking and thinking. We say, God, you're missing. I see A, B, and C here, God. Isn't there something different than you should be doing? And that's when we have to set A, B, and C aside and say, God, you've told me to do this, so I'm going to do it even though I don't get it. It looks scary. I can't figure out your timing. I don't think this is going to work. Yet God calls us to do that. And sometimes with our brains operating like this and God telling us to do stuff, we run into some difficulties. And one of the times, some of the times that we run into these difficulties is around major events on the calendar. We love it when we get to Christmas and Easter and Mother's Day and Father's Day. Well, we love it if everything is going swimmingly in our lives. And then we just get to bask in the glory of these events. But what if things aren't going swimmingly in our lives and we come up to one of these events? not quite so fun for us anymore. Our culture around us, everybody around us has a happy face on and we are silently struggling with something in, the, 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 in this context that our culture is painting or maybe the, 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 our, 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 the word is painting around us and yet it's a struggle for us. Teenagers are great at arguing about things, aren't they? My, my teenagers are great at arguing. Okay, all right, counselor, I've heard it, but dad has spoken. I've, I've, I'll tell you the number of times I've said that. But um, my 16-year-old, who's, oh, well, enough on him. And, but uh, even as adults, we still do the same thing, don't we? We still want to argue with God when he commands us to do something. We see a different approach that we think we should be taking. And then we hit something like Father's Day. And Father's Day is an awesome day for some people, awesome day for a lot of people. But let's be honest here for a minute. Let's be real. Father's Day is not a great day for everybody because it may be that their relationship with their father is not a good one or was not a good one. It may be that, that um, your father was at times a creep and did a lot of bad things to you or your siblings or your mother and your family. And now you hit Father's Day. What are you supposed to do about this? And if you've been a good reader of your Bible and you've been in the book of Exodus chapter 20 where the Ten Commandments are listed, then you run into this verse, which is verse 12, where God commands, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. 
What? And you th- immediately think to yourself, but God, you don't know my father. <laughs> you don't know my father. He doesn't deserve honor from me. And, or God, you know my father. Why on earth would you tell me to be honoring him? Because he abandoned us, he abused us, he didn't give us the basic provisions that we needed, he cheated on mom all the time. This litany of things that could be running through your head, and all of those things are reality. They are the reality. And yet, yet God's saying, honor your father. What do you do with that on Father's Day? That's what we want to unpack just a little bit more today. I, I don't want you for one minute to think that I'm going to say, well, get over it and honor your father. That's not what I'm going to say. We want to look at what the word has to say for us a little bit more to help us unpack this. And I believe that each one of us can honor our father and our mother, even if that person was not like uh, the Happy Days families or Leave it to Beaver or somebody like that. We can still honor that person. And here's why. Because honoring your mother and father may be different for me compared to you, compared to you, compared to you. For so long, I thought, why doesn't God explain to me what it means to honor? And I was, wow. Because for each person, it may well be radically different. I don't mean a little bit. It may be radically different for a, for a Christian believer to fulfill that command that God lays on our life. Some of you are tremendously blessed. Your father was A number one. I had a couple people come up to me after the first service and said, you know, Mark, I feel so relieved. My father's my hero. He's such a great guy. Father's Day is easy for me. And some, some other folks come up to me and say, oh, this resonated with me because my father's not a hero to me. That's the reality that we face here. And so if that's the case, we're going to express honoring our father in different ways. It's going to come out meaning looking like very different things. But nonetheless, each one of us has the ability and is called to honor our, our parents. And so I want to offer you five, five specifics about how if this is a situation that you were in this morning on Father's Day, five very specific things to help you through this morass of wanting to fulfill this command and dealing with the reality of the emotions on the flip side, okay? Is this tracking for everybody? Yeah. All right. So five suggestions that I would offer you about how to make it, how you can go about fulfilling this command of honoring your father. The first is to stop thinking that God is like your earthly father. Stop thinking that God is like your earthly father. Uh, One of the struggles that people can have is they see the word father in the Bible, our heavenly father, and they start equating the two. So, well, if God is at all like this father of mine, I don't want to have anything to do with God. And I'm saying that is wrong. And that perspective completely denigrates who God is because God is not like the best of us. God is not like at all. He is God. We should not be linking the two together in any way, shape, or or form. For those people with awesome fathers, the same thing holds true. I'm glad your father is awesome or was awesome, but he still is not God. Our heavenly father is so much dramatically more significant. Here are these words from Psalm 95 that give us a little clue, a little description of God. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. God, God is unlike anything else. Don't link your earthly father at all with your heavenly father in your mind. Secondly, I think this is super important. I want you to understand that God shares your disappointment about your father. He wanted, God wants the best for you. And yet God has given us free will in this world and he's disappointed whenever anybody is doing something that is negatively impacting somebody else. You know, because our bad behavior does and can and does affect other people, doesn't it? Your father's negative behavior may have impacted you, and God is not pleased about this. He's displeased with it. The Old Testament book of 2 Kings talks about God's displeasure with the Israelites. Uh, they, so they finally, they're in the promised land. They have griped and griped, and they finally gives them a king. And then we see this slow slide of their society as their behavior becomes worse and worse. They have not expelled everybody from the promised land as God had told them to do. And those other cultures 
are now nipping away at their edges and, and, and causing them to not follow God and honor him as much as they can. And so eventually God is going to be punishing them by taking them into exile because they're wandering farther and farther away from him. One of the ways that they are displeasing him and moving away from him is in their treatment of others. The, the, the Jewish culture is, is, is declining and they're not treating those around them as well here. And, we, and so besides worshiping all these other made-up gods, we read this in 2 Kings 17, 15. They, the Jewish people, imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. They were not treating other people well and that displeased God. I don't want you for one minute to believe the lie if you've been told it that you deserved to be treated that way. That is not what God has in store for anybody. We do not deserve to be treated poorly by somebody else. And so if you were told that by your father or somebody, I'll tell you, they were wrong. I can't make that memory go away, but they were wrong. Sometimes the things are inflicted upon us that we can't control. I knew, I know a woman in Vermont and she had a um, fractured relationship with her father. One day, out of the blue, a letter arrives in the mail from her father, says, I never want to speak to you again. Out of the blue. It wasn't a result of something that that had happened. It's just him making this announcement about the fact that he wants to be utterly severed from her life and she to be severed from her life. She's not a Christian believer and so she didn't have the Lord to fall back on, but it, but it raises the question because I'm sure that what she experienced is not unique. What does a Christian believer do with that when, when their father is completely separated and wanting to be separated? And so, and so our third and fourth points really focus on this issue. The first response for us is that we need to what? We need to pray for our father, pray for his salvation, pray for other relationships that he have, has, pray for his attitude, you know, we are usually a product of our upbringing, aren't we? Well, our father's the same way. For better or for worse, our father is a product of his upbringing, choices that he did not get to make either. There may have been difficulties in his childhood that unfortunately led him down a road of thought and belief and attitude and action that uh, you bore some of the brunt of. But then Matthew 6.6 6, is this verse that tells us something about how we're supposed to respond to it. And I, we're gonna emphasize the first part of the verse, not the second part that keeps talk, using the word father, that's almost coincidental. Matthew 6, 6 reads, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Uh, of the thing, that, what I particularly like in that verse is the intentionality that's expressed in it. If you have bad memories of your father and you to feel like this Father's Day thing is a drag, there is some intentionality in this verse to go into the room, close the door and pray. It will not happen on its own. You're not gonna wake up suddenly one morning and think, wow, you know, I had some bad memories about that, but it's all taken care of. It's not happening that way. You're going to have to be intentional about pursuing, (coughs) excuse me, about pursuing God through this. And If that's where you are, then truth be told, (laughs) you may have no desire to pray for your father. And it may be that that's where your prayer is going to have to start. Lord, I don't want to pray about him or for him because of X and Y. Yet, Lord, you command me to honor him. And I know this is one of the ways that I should be honoring him. So I need you to help me in this. Give me something to pray about for him. Guard my heart while I'm doing it. Help protect me. Help me work my way through this because I'm wanting to honor you because God, you are the most significant relationship in my life and I'm going to obey you. So I need your help in that area. If her father, if she had been a Christian believer, that is where my friend Michelle would have had, it, would have had to go. Related to that though, there's a second thing that we can do when we have a, this fractured relationship with our father about honoring him, and that is to honor your father with your words. And oftentimes what that is going to mean is less about the words that you use and more about the words that you don't use. It's, 
It's saying, you know what? I'm not going to disparage this person. I'm not going to run around telling 50 people about what my father was like and my unhappiness and this and that. It may be sharing with a couple people or individuals at key times. I, gotta, I, I want, need to share with you about something that I went through, or this and that. But, you know, and we understand this on a, more broadly speaking in life, don't we? That it's not good to go around gossiping about people, not good to just, we don't, we don't go talk negatively about people. Well, the same thing has to do with our parents and our efforts to honor them. It may be that silence is you, one of the ways that you honor your father by simply by not talking about him because you know every time you do, it can, what comes out of your mouth is not positive. And so you honor him by not speaking about him or at least uh, not talking about him very much. The fifth piece is, again, if this is where you are, is that uh, as you're desiring to honor your father, is that you need to pray for yourself. You need to ask the Lord to remake you on the inside, to give you a fresh perspective and a fresh ability to think positively about this person or at least to pray for them and to ask God's blessing into that person's life. Uh, I, I get it, you know, Scripture tells us we're supposed to pray for our enemies, right? I'll tell you, we've all been through, me too, times where we're like, oh, this person was not good to me. And Lord, the last thing I want to do is pray for this person. I'm not interested in praying blessings into their lives. I've been through this thing where I say, okay, God. So here's what a pastor does. God, I know I need to be obedient about this. What kind of a blessing can I pray in this person's life when I don't, don't really want you to bless them? And that's like the start of working through this, right? Okay. Okay, God, I guess that wasn't quite so bad. Now I can pray something a little bit more for this person. But we're, we're forcing ourselves to think, saying, and you may have to be in a, you may really need uh, uh, the Holy Spirit to involve himself in your life to give you the ability uh, to cope with what you've done. One of the things you may want to do is you may want to ask God to bring a scrub brush into your memory and just to remove from your memory some of the things that you've experienced. That's not what you want to be focusing on. You, you're saying, God, I don't want to focus on that. God, I just want to just remove some of these burdens that overwhelm me emotionally or mentally. Help to transform me. I didn't get to control these things, God. It wasn't my decision. Do a fresh work in me along these lines. Yeah, I know this, some of this is sort of a... Um, Deep And here we, it's Father's Day and we want to revel in how great it is to celebrate Father's Day. But the reality again is, is that this, these thoughts that I've been sharing are thoughts that run through some of your minds. And, um, and it's the reality of life. The great thing is, is that our Lord wants to step in close to everybody in this room and transform our lives in 50 different ways. And so um, at the end of the service, you're going to have an opportunity to come forward if you would like prayer about this issue, about something having to do with the relationship with your father or mother or somebody else or any other thing that you want prayer about, you're going to be able to come forward and sort of privately get prayer about that. But even before that, it may be that um, some of you are sitting here thinking, I don't have a close relationship with God. Perhaps it's because of my father. I've never been able to step close in a trusting relationship with anybody. And yet you may feel your heart is beating a little bit faster this morning. It's like uh, you don't quite know what's going on, but God is doing something and you think and you're fighting against it. Or it may be that you have been waiting for this time all week long to come in the church because God has been working on your heart and you are ready. You are ready to take a step into a new relationship with him. You don't even understand what that means really inside. You just know you want God for the first time. And I assume that there are some of you like that here this morning. And the question is, will you be able to take that step across the line and say, okay, God, I'm ready to end this current chapter of my life. I'm ready to start volume two, which is my life with you. So I'd like to ask everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. And if I've been describing you just now, if you are a person that does not have a close relationship with God and you want it, you have an opportunity to say, Jesus, I want you in my life. Come and get me. I'm right here. My heart is open. And if that's who you are right now, I would just ask you to raise your hand right now. Just slip up your hand and say, uh, this is who I want. I, God, I want more of you in my life. That's you. Just slip up your hand right now. 
if you want more of God in your life. I see your hand. Thank you for that, sir. That's such a great thing to say, God, I need you more in my life. And so I'd ask the whole church to pray along with me, to echo my prayer as we pray a prayer about welcoming Jesus into our life. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Just pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. I need Jesus. I've done bad things in my life. Please forgive me of those and help me to live your way, not my way. I want to feel your power in my life this morning, God. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That is a great thing, isn't it? That is a great thing. You know, the Bible tells us when somebody gives their life to Christ, the angels are rejoicing in heaven about the soul that has been saved. That is an awesome thing. And I will never for the, my whole life get my brain around what that must look like and sound like. What an incredible thing. And that's what happens every time somebody becomes a Christian believer.